Thank you very much, General Pruitt. Uh, please join me uh, in welcoming Judge Sandra Kuda, who's going to serve as your moderator for the next 90 minutes as we discuss preserving freedom. Judge Akuta has served as a judge for the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit since 2006. Uh, before her appointment, she was a partner at O'Melveny and Myers LLP. She also served as a law clerk for U.S. Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor and for Alex Kaczynski of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Uh, before her legal career, she took an unorthodox path, uh, which included serving as the first female editor-in-chief of the National Martial Arts Magazine. Uh, so I think she'll be able to keep the panelists in check today. Uh, Judge Ikuda. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with a distinguished panel to my uh, mic is not on. Uh, can you hear me? Okay, here we go. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here to, um, with a distinguished panel to discuss the timely and extremely important issue about the challenges and threats to our federal system. And I'd like to uh, start by introducing our panelists. Uh, first, Adam Friedman. He's next to me here. He's the author of A Less Perfect Union, the case for states' rights. Friedman is a practicing lawyer, or as I said, a real lawyer, um, but writes frequently about constitutional and legal issues for various publications, including City Journal, Ricochet, and The Wall Street Journal. His previous books include The Naked Constitution, What the Founders Said and Why It Still Matters, and The Party of the First Part, which is a history of legal language. Christina Sandifer, over here, is the Executive Vice President at the Goldwater Institute. She's won important victories for property rights in Arizona and works uh, nationally to promote the Institute's Private Property Rights Protection Act, which would require state governments to pay owners when regulations destroy property rights and reduce property values. That would be a new one. Uh, she's also a co-drafter of the Right to Try initiative, uh, now law in 24 states, which protects terminally ill patients' right to try medical treatments that have been prescribed by physicians, but not yet FDA approved. Sandifer is the co-author of the book, Cornerstone of Liberty, Private Property Rights in 21st Century America. She's also a frequent guest on national television and talk radio programs. And at the far end is Adam Winkler. He's a professor at UCLA School of Law, an excellent school, my alma mater. Uh, he's a specialist in American constitutional law. His scholarship has been cited by the US Supreme Court, and his writing has appeared in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, and a list really too long to mention. Sorry. He's authored over two dozen scholarly articles, co-edited the Encyclopedia of the American Constitution, and published over 80 opinion pieces on legal issues. He's the author of the book, Gunfight, The Battle Over the Right to Bear Arms in America. And he's currently writing a book on how corporations become people under the Constitution. Uh, please join me in welcoming our distinguished panelists. Thank you. It's good having law clerks. <laughs> okay, let's get started. I, I always think it's important to start with first principles, so we're all sure we're, we're talking about the same thing. So the Supreme Court frequently mentions our federalism, there's always our federalism, and has said that it occupies a highly important place in our nation's history and its future. But what exactly is our federalism? So I'd like to start today by asking um, the professor, of course, to give us a brief background about what federalism means in United States history and what we mean by it today. <laughs> 
for oh, that seems to be on, uh, uh, and for our uh, panelists uh, for uh, organizing this uh, discussion, and of course to all of you for actually being here. Um, I feel looking out at this crowd to give you a, a primer on federalism is in most cases unnecessary. But for those uh, who don't uh, know much about federalism, just want to have a, just a few minute introduction to the basic principle uh, of federalism under our constitutional system. Uh, federalism is basically uh, the constitutional idea of uh, uh, shared powers between the federal government uh, and the state governments. Shared powers or divided powers. Um, we have a nation in which we have 50 sovereign states and a sovereign federal government, uh, and none of them are completely sovereign, uh, and none of them are completely dependent upon the others. Um, we know that the basic principles of federalism under our constitutional system are that the states have plenary power. Uh, they have the power to regulate uh, just about anything so long as the Constitution does not prohibit them from regulating in a particular area. Uh, there's not too many areas in which the Constitution does prohibit states from regulating, um, but there are areas, uh, and then we have a, a collateral principle that the federal government has only limited enumerated powers, those powers that are provided to the federal government in the Constitution uh, itself. Um, <clears throat> The debates over uh, federalism have been uh, uh, wide-ranging and have really marked many of the central controversies of American history, going back to uh, the original Articles of Confederation. As many of you will remember, our Articles of Confederation uh, was deemed by our founding uh, generation to be um, uh, a poorly structured document that had too much sovereignty for the states and not enough power by the federal government to require and enforce states to do things like pay revolutionary war debts. Um, and so the Constitution was formed to both maintain this idea of some semblance of state sovereignty and state plenary power, while at the same time strengthening the federal government, giving the federal government the ability to respond to the kinds of issues that the states could not uh, easily uh, grasp or easily manage. We tend often these days to think of them in a more modern terminology where there are so-called collective action problems where we don't expect states to be able to come together and to regulate consistently and effectively uh, and that the framers gave some of those powers to the federal government to regulate uh, uh, instead. Um, we've seen disputes over whether the proper uh, locus of authority to regulate some aspect of American life um, run through uh, disputes over slavery uh, and civil rights. Uh, today we see it over marriage and guns and uh, drug legalization and uh, a host of other issues um, uh, from health care uh, and uh, uh, other controversies. Um, and so uh, we know that federalism is uh, an area of great dispute. It's an area, federalism is a principle that's often used and invoked as a way of uh, enhancing or insisting upon uh, the power um, primary regulatory authority of states. Um, uh, and uh, what we know from uh, our experience with federalism uh, is that it, it has often been associated with uh, the right side of the political spectrum, but I don't think that that uh, really captures uh, the sense of federalism today. We see federalism invoked on the left as well, uh, less often to be sure, but in areas, for instance, like drug legalization, uh, where there is a push to have uh, uh, more states' rights uh, advanced by uh, those on the other side of the political spectrum than the traditional uh, um, advocates for uh, states' rights. And I think we're going to, one of our jobs on this panel will be to talk about some of those current controversies and how federalism issues structure, shape, uh, and change uh, how we might think about those issues. Federalism is, of course, vitally important on both the left and the right, in part because uh, we do have a federal government that has, since the New Deal, uh, gained an incredible amount of regulatory authority over our lives, uh, and, uh, uh, and thus pressure for more power at the state and local level um, is inevitable uh, in a, a society where different people are seeking different ideas of the good life. So. So, so we expect to have a, a lively conversation about some specific issues, but 
any disagreement about the definition of federalism. Uh, uh, hi, and uh, thanks also, as Adam W. said, to the Federalist Society and everyone for coming here. I, I thought that summary was excellent, and there are just a couple of points that I would emphasize to introduce some themes that I, I hope to come back to, which is um, uh, Adam W. spoke about sh this is a system of shared powers. Um, you know, at a high level, that's true, but shared powers makes it sound, I think it can be potentially misleading in two senses. One, shared powers sounds like, it, it, it sounds like the states and the federal government got together and divvied up powers. In, a, in, our, federal, in our federal system, it's, the, it's a system in which the states decided which of their sovereign powers they would cede to a central government uh, in order to form a stronger union. It's a structure deliberately designed to maximize local self-government within a union. And so um, the other thing about shared powers is I want to focus on the rights side of the equation. Federalism uh, in our system is deliberately designed to protect a particular right and avoid a particular danger. It's designed to protect the right to local self-government that is enshrined in, in most famously in the, in the Tenth Amendment, but is inherent in the structure of the Constitution. And that is a right, as much as any of the rights enshrined in the first eight uh, amendments to the Constitution. And the specific danger that it's trying to avoid is tyranny, the concentration of power in any one uh, level or division of government. And so um, I, I don't necessarily disagree with the idea of shared powers, but I think we also have to remember that this was for a purpose. It was deliberately to uh, protect a right, the right to self-government. So, so let me define federalism then as a tug of war between federal and state governments. Uh, and we'll discuss some of these issues in light of two central questions. How far can the states go in asserting their independence from the federal government? And how far can the federal government go to control the states? Christina, did you disagree with that? No, I think that's, I think that's well put. And uh, I, I would also like to reiterate uh, my fellow panelists' thanks to the Federalist Society for having me here. Um, one thing that I, I want to sort of set as a framework um, before we continue on to talk about the specifics uh, is that federalism is not a, an end in itself, but it's a means to an end. And I, and I think we've heard that theme a little bit uh, so far uh, th with what the panelists have said, but uh, I think it's important. In fact, the title of our uh, event today is Federalism and Freedom, and that is the end that federalism serves. It's the point of the Constitution. It's to protect individual freedom. Now, I uh, come from an organization that primarily works within the states and uses the tools of federalism in order to protect people's rights. And uh, at, coming from, from such an organization, I think it's important for me to push back a little bit on the, the traditional federalism model as well so that we make sure that people are talking about federalism responsibly. So the one thing that you will never hear uh, me utter is the phrase states' rights. Uh, we've heard it uh, discussed a little bit or thrown out there a little bit uh, from the other panelists. And although it might seem like a trivial nuance, I think it's important uh, to talk about states' powers when we talk about federalism and not states' rights. And the reason for that is because people have rights, states have powers, and that, and using the term states' powers reminds us the purpose um, for, of the purpose of federalism, again, which is to protect individual liberty. And so uh, given that framework, I think that we can think about the issues we're going to discuss today uh, by going through three basic points about federalism. Uh, when we talk about how the states and the federal government interact with each other and what they have the powers to do. Uh, the first is that the federal government cannot force states to enact laws. We know that as the anti-commandeering principle, uh, and so the federal government can't come into a state and tell the state to uh, enact or enforce laws that the federal government thinks are proper. And in fact, uh, under the spending clause, the federal government can't even come into a state and force a state to act based on money that the federal government is going to give to that state. Now, we know that the federal government can bribe states to act uh, in ways that the federal government thinks, is, uh, thinks that the state should act uh, under the spending clause, but uh, even that has limits. And although we've heard the Supreme Court talk about those limits for a number of years, 
We saw that principle enforced just recently in 2012 in the first Affordable Care Act case, NFIB versus Sebelius, when the Supreme Court said, in fact, that the Affordable Care Act's provision that told states that the federal government would take back all the state's Medicaid funding if the states didn't expand their Medicaid programs beyond what was originally imagined to be the purpose of the Medicaid program, uh, then, then the states would lose all of their funding. And the Supreme Court said that this was an abuse of um, the anti-commandeering principle, and it was an abuse of the federal government's spending clause uh, powers. And so, um, so, so again, there's, there are areas where the federal government can't intrude on states' powers. There are also areas where when the federal government acts, acts unlawfully, uh, either it acts beyond the powers that have been given to it uh, in the federal constitution or it acts to intrude on individual liberties, then states can, and I would argue states must, step in to protect those individual liberties and to push back against the federal government. Every official, uh, elected official in state government, takes an oath of office to uphold the federal constitution and the constitution of that elected official's state. And so it is the duty of those officials to step in and use federalism, use states' powers to push back against the federal government and protect the citizens within that official state when the federal government oversteps its reach. Uh, and, and in fact, that was the founder's vision of federalism. And in Federalist 51, Madison calls this a compound republic that we have. And he said that our system of federalism uh, presents a, uh, a system of dual security for the rights of the people. So that is the duty of the states. Now, again, I, I talk about responsible federalism. And so it's important to note the third principle, the converse of that, that when the federal government is acting lawfully, uh, then the states cannot step in and nullify a lawfully enacted federal law just because the states don't like the particular uh, policy preferences of the federal government. And that is important as well when we talk about protecting individual rights because, of course, uh, as Attorney General Pruitt said, states can go too far and they can act in ways that infringe on individual rights. And when they do that, we rely on the federal government to step in and protect individuals. Uh, so, so with that framework, that's the way that uh, that at least I think that we should think about these issues that we'll be discussing throughout the remainder of this panel. So within those broad uh, principles, uh, we decide we, we turn to specific issues and consider some specific examples, uh, starting with where state governments have, have attempted to provide their citizens with more opportunities or rights than the federal government has approved. And the first specific example we wanted to discuss was the uh, Right to Try initiative. So legislation in some 24 states allows terminally ill patients to try medicine that has not yet been fully FDA approved for the market. So let me start with Christina. Is, is this an example of how federalism should work or does it, does it undermine the federal government's policy? Well, I may be a little biased here being uh, one of the co-drafters of the Right to Try model legislation that's passed in 24 states. But yes, I think that this is exactly a, a perfect example of how federalism is supposed to work. Uh, in, in this case, we're looking at the, the second framework uh, that, that I laid out, um, an area where the federal government has failed to protect the rights of its citizens. So just a, a little bit of brief background, under the current FDA regulatory structure, uh, it can take about a decade, sometimes longer, and a billion dollars for potentially life-saving medication to make its way to market. If you've been diagnosed with a terminal illness and uh, medicine that could help save your life or ease your suffering is 10 years from being approved for market, uh, then you are out of luck. Now, there are some, uh, some exceptions. Of course, the FDA will say that you can be allowed to participate in a clinical trial, which is the science experiments that we go through in order to approve uh, these medicines. But only 3% of all sickest, of the uh, sickest patients actually make it into clinical trials. The other 97% are left, literally, to beg the federal government for permission for the right to try to save their own lives. Now, when we take a step back to first principles, the first principle of, the first fundamental principle of any free society ought to be that a person owns her own life and that the right to medical autonomy or to make your own medical decisions is fundamental. And if that is the case, then it is immoral and unconstitutional for the federal government to deny individuals that right. 
But yet that's exactly what the FDA does in this permission system where you have to ask, ask the federal government in order to take medications, even medications that could save your life. And unfortunately, that's what our courts have done, too, to the extent that they have weighed in. The, the question of uh, right, the, that right to try um, scenario presents has never been heard by the United States Supreme Court. But several years back, the Abigail Alliance brought a case up to the D.C. Circuit. Uh, this was a case where um, a young woman was diagnosed with cancer and wanted to take an experimental medication that, had, that was working its way through the FDA process. It had been deemed safe for testing in human beings and was given to human beings uh, in clinical trials, but was not yet approved for market. She asked the federal government for an exception to be able to try this medication. and argued in court, uh, and in fact her, her father and the organization continued the argument after she unfortunately passed away, argued in court that the due process clause protects her right to be able to try to access these medications um, when in fact they have passed basic safety testing, your doctor has told you that your illness will kill you and we know that these drugs won't, uh, you should be able to make that decision with your doctor whether or not you want to take that medication while it's still working its way through the clinical trial process. A three-judge panel of the D.C. Circuit in the Abigail Alliance case agreed with the Abigail Alliance and said, yes, this is a fundamental right that's protected by the Constitution. But unfortunately, on an en banc rehearing, the full panel of the D.C. Circuit reversed that decision and said, your right, essentially, your right to try to save your life is not a fundamental right, but it's a liberty interest, uh, a distinction that only an attorney uh, could appreciate. But we know what that really means is that it's, it's some sort of right, but it's a right that courts are going to treat as second class rights and are not going to protect to the full extent of, what they sh uh, of how they should. Uh, and so, in this sense, we, uh, when we have a liberty interest, we weigh the interest of your liberty interest and the interest of the government in regulating. And here we're going to defer to Congress and to the FDA uh, in their judgment. And we are going to say that they can regulate in this area and that you don't have the ability to take that medication. Now, again, this case, as I mentioned, was never heard by the Supreme Court. But one interesting call out in the district, uh, in the D.C. Circuit's opinion, was that, uh, again, the call out to defer to the democratic process. And the court said that if the people want to pr protect this right, then they should go to the legislature to do that. So in many ways, right to try, uh, I, I would argue that, of course, the people should not have to go through the democratic processes to protect their own individual rights that are guaranteed to them by the Constitution. But our founders desi designed this system um, of checks and balances and of federalism precisely to help individuals when the system fails them. And so right to try in, in many senses is a response to that call of action. Uh, right to try says that if you have been diagnosed with a terminal illness and you have exhausted all of your government approved options and there is a medication working its way through the FDA clinical trial process that has passed basic FDA safety testing that is being currently tested on human beings in clinical trials that you uh, can, and your doctor gives you a prescription that you can have a right to try to take that medication um, in hopes that it will save your life. 24 states have passed right to try. Uh, it's now protecting about half of the United States population. And of course, in a group of lawyers, the question then becomes, well, how is that possible when that seems to contradict what the FDA has said on the matter? The FDA uh, has said that you can't take these medications uh, in, until we approve them for market unless we grant you a special permission or exception. And the answer to that, of course, goes back to that second area of federalism. When the federal government has failed to protect your right uh, to try to save your life, and, uh, then, then the states can step in and do so. The, the United States Constitution provides a floor to protect rights. It does not provide a ceiling, and states can go beyond what the United States Constitution does uh, in protecting rights. And so um, in this area, the, this, the right to try laws are operating. They're currently protecting patients. They have never been challenged in court um, by the FDA. They may. The FDA may decide to do so at some point. And if they do, uh, I think that the right to try laws are on very strong legal grounds. The, court, the Supreme Court has recognized the medical autonomy right in a number of scenarios, including your right to refuse life-saving treatment. If you have a right to refuse life-saving treatment, then you should have a right to choose to take potentially life-saving treatment. 
especially when it's, it's past basic safety testing. Um, and then also we see a series of federalism cases where the Supreme Court has deferred to the traditional state powers. Uh, the states have traditionally protected the practice of medicine, and that's really what we're talking about here. We're not talking about circumventing the FDA's power to um, pr approve drugs for final, uh, final market approval, but rather the practice of medicine itself. And the court has deferred to states' powers in those cases, including um, in uh, the Gonzalez versus Oregon case, where the court upheld Oregon's right to die law, uh, essentially allowing terminally ill patients who are out of options to choose to end their lives with dignity, um, it, even though uh, over the objections of the United States Attorney General in that area, and the court said that the states have the powers here again to regulate medicine and uh, and to step in here and protect their citizens' rights. So. Admittedly, this can be a sloppy process um, if the federal government would step up and I would argue do its job and protect this important right, then we would have universal protection throughout the United States. Here we have 24 states protecting this right and an open legal question that eventually will have to be resolved by the Supreme Court. But again, um, this is the system our founders envisioned and it's better than nothing because people in 24 states and people who travel to those 24 states are now protected and are being treated under this law and that's exactly the way that our federalist system is supposed to operate. So, so maybe we should hear the other side of this. Why, given that there's no fundamental right, at least not yet, to uh, try medicines if you're terminally ill, why isn't this all preempted by the federal uh, government preempt, uh, occupying the field? Um, Adam, do you have a view on this? Well, I wasn't going to address uh, specifically the federal preemption question, although that's obviously uh, an important one. Uh, Congress has regulated um, uh, the uh, uh, pharmaceutical industry uh, in, in part uh, through the Commerce Clause and the regulation of interstate commerce. There's no doubt that when you're purchasing drugs from uh, a corporation that manufactures them in another state, uh, you are engaged in interstate commerce, and the court has... Um, for better or worse, interpreted the Commerce Clause quite broadly to mean that the federal government can reach in-state instances of economic activity, even if uh, that one particular incident uh, does not reach across state lines, uh, if the aggregated impact of all of those uh, individual inc isolated incidents <coughs> do have a substantial impact on interstate commerce. And clearly, um, uh, the choice of uh, and access to drugs is one of those issues. But I think the right to try also, while I commend the idea of having medical, sort of medical self-defense, a right to try, I think the, the, the right to try movement also highlights um, what I think is uh, one of the problems with federalism in America today, which is that Adam uh, said earlier that federalism is a means to an end, or maybe it was Christina who said it was a means to an end to um, uh, local self-control, to create local self-control. Um, I think actually I'm a, I have a more cynical view of federalism, and I think federalism is a means to an end, but usually it's a means, a, a means to achieving a particular policy preference uh, and that people will cite states rights or cite federal power when they think that is uh, a convenient way to get their policy agendas adopted. Uh, and it's not necessarily a, a real genuine embrace of federalism. And I think we can see that in the right to try movement. We see right to try laws being passed at the state level. That does seem like a real manifestation of a principle of federalism that the state should be empowered to respond to this kind of problem. But it's also operating on a track of trying to claim that there is a fundamental right embodied in the Constitution, supreme over every state and the federal government, uh, to have uh, a due process right to try. If that constitutional argument wins, it, is not at the in it does not enhance local self-government. It completely diminishes local self-government. It imposes a federal constitutional standard on every state in the nation and on the federal government. Um, and so to the extent that the right to try movement is about uh, adopting state laws that reflect local um, preferences, uh, then it seems like a manifestation of federalism. But to the extent that it's arguing for a constitutional right, 
then it really isn't a means towards local self-control. It's a means towards getting a policy agenda adopted uh, in a way that inhibits local self-control. And so I think it just kind of highlights that we all have, or m many of us have very conflicted views of federalism, that we want federalism when we think uh, that state powers are going to achieve the agenda that we want, uh, and often are willing to sacrifice that principle of state powers when we think that the agenda that we want can be better accomplished either through federal legislation or in the right to try example through the creation of a constitutional right that no state can uh, restrict or burden. Yeah, I'm just going to jump in for a sec because yeah, I, I was the local self-government guy um, and, um, and I, agree with, I agree with Adam that there are certainly lots of fair weather federalists who are federalists you know, when it suits them, right? When, uh, when No Child Left Behind was being proposed by President Bush, Howard Dean got up on the hustings and said, how dare Washington dictate education policy to the states? And then, <laughs> that was Howard Dean, right? Um, so, um, but I do think that um, Adam points to um, uh, an issue where, uh, you know, I agree that Christina said, and I respect the idea that states don't have rights, individuals do, um, I take a different view, and I think that if you have to shoehorn these issues into the vindication of an individual right, you're limiting federalism. Federalism is um, the basic principle that that which is not delegated to the central government is retained by the states. You don't need, it doesn't have to vindicate an individual right, in, in my view. That right is inherent in the structure. The structure um, gives the state, in my view, the right to legislate on these things. And whether you call it a right of a state to local self-government or the right of its people to enjoy local self-government, it, it comes down to much the same thing. Last word. Do I, do I get a rebuttal, Your Honor? <laughs> Um, well, I, I'm, I'm actually surprised to find that I agree and disagree with both Adams um, at, at the simultaneously, so which is usually the position I find myself in. Um, but but I will say that uh, that I I agree that the end of federalism is not local control, but again is to preserve individual rights. And um, and to that extent, the states in passing right to try laws are not reading into the Constitution a right that isn't there. In fact, in my opinion, it's quite the opposite. What they're doing is enforcing the Constitution as it rightly should be enforced, but, um, but the courts, to the extent the courts have weighed in on this question, uh, and the federal government have uh, failed to enforce. And so th that, that is really the import of the Right to Try movement. Now, when we, come, when we consider uh, whether or not a, you know, a state is properly protecting a right that the federal government has failed to protect or whether a state is simply asserting its own policy preferences um, in direct contradiction with something that the federal government clearly has the power to do, that, you know, that's a touchy subject. And of course, that's going to come down to individual interpretation. I think that if we believe in objective truth and we believe that there is a right or wrong answer, which I think uh, that we all do if we believe that um, the courts are able to resolve those questions, then um, then there, there is a distinction between the two, but uh, in principle, but practically figuring out what that distinction is, is difficult. And um, the way that our country has chosen to do that is through the court system. So, um, so again, a lot of this will remain to be seen. It will remain to be seen um, how the courts treat this issue. But, uh, but that, is, that is the distinction as far as I see it. Let's move to a somewhat similar issue, which is uh, the marijuana initiatives that we're seeing. So under federal law, doctors can't prescribe uh, marijuana for medical use, and unauthorized possession and use is a federal crime. Uh, but several states have authorized medical use, and now Colorado has uh, legalized recreational use. And uh, there's a question that's arising, whether these initiatives are preempted. There's a, a cert petition, pen, uh, actually a complaint pending, original jurisdiction complaint. Uh, Nebraska and Oklahoma versus Colorado, which says that Colorado's law is preempted by the Controlled Substances Act. So have the states gone too far in these marijuana initiatives? Adam? Uh, right. Um, have they gone too far? Uh, well, from a practical standpoint, I would say no, because they're, they're winning, right? To use a kind of Donald Trump analysis, they're winning. <laughs> um, right? Uh, uh, that these initiatives have taken off like wildfire, wildfire and uh, the administration has really backed off from its initial position that they would uh, 
uh, not prosecute seriously ill, indiv ill individuals, but they would still prosecute dispensaries and other instrumentalities of marijuana regimes. And now they really, um, the latest guidance to uh, att uh, assistant U.S. attorneys is um, don't interfere with states implementing their uh, medical marijuana regimes uh, unless, uh, as long as those state regimes have some very basic protections. One of those protections is avoiding spillover effects to neighboring states, and that's, and that's a legitimate concern. Uh, but on the broader sort of legal question, have they gone too far? I would, I would argue no, um, for a few reasons. Uh, first, on the, on the preemption issue, I, I, think that that, I think that that almost borders on the frivolous, because the Controlled Substances Act, by its own terms, doesn't preempt state laws. Um, and uh, it, only, it only preempts state laws where there is a positive conflict. So it's essentially a supremacy question, uh, because this, in that sense, the conflict, in my view, the conflict preemption and supremacy clause end up being the same thing. Supremacy is how you resolve those direct conflicts. Um, so first of all, is there, is there a, a supremacy issue? For, uh, no, because uh, although there might be parts of the CSA, Controlled Substances Act, that are valid federal law, um, I would argue that uh, there is simply no constitutional basis for the federal government to regulate possession or growing of uh, marijuana that has no nexus to interstate commerce. Um, and supremacy only applies to valid federal laws, federal laws that are made pursuant to the Constitution. And to get to the Controlled Substances Act being a valid federal law, you have to follow in the um, uh, undistinguished line, I would say, of Wickard v. Filburn, where uh, growing wheat uh, on your own property for your own consumption is interstate commerce. Um, alas, the Supreme Court has done that. So I have to go to reason two, which is uh, if we assume that the CSA is a valid federal law, um, it, is there a supremacy issue? And still here, I would argue uh, no, um, because there's no direct conflict. What are these states doing? The states are essentially, from a legal point of view, are simply removing state prohibitions on marijuana use. Um, they, are not, they are not claiming to nullify federal law. Um, if the states passed a law mandating that the citizens smoked weed, that would be a supremacy problem. <laughs> if they pass a law prohibiting federal agents from coming into their borders and enforcing the CSA, then you'd have a supremacy problem. But here, you have state inaction. They've simply removed certain penalties. Um, there's clearly an inconsistency between federal and state policy, right? From the federal point of view, no one should be smoking pot, even if they're sick. The states, at least, uh, 23 states plus the District of Columbia take a different view. Um, but if you argue that that's a supremacy problem, then you'd have to say that the, that the federal government has the power to demand that states enact a particular marijuana regime, a regime of prohibition. And to Christina's earlier point, the anti commandeering uh, principle of, of the New York case and the Prince case um, say the federal government can't do that. They can't force states to take a particular stand um, on marijuana use. And so, um, you know, I, I think it's perfectly legitimate for states to legalize marijuana under state law, and I would add, perfectly legitimate for them to withhold state assets from enforcing the federal prohibition on marijuana. If the feds want to, want to enforce a marijuana prohibition, they can send their agents into California and they can try to enforce it. Um, States could, eat, could still have a, a, a cause of action if they want to try to do this uh, against those federal agents. They'll get caught up in qualified immunity and things like that. But, um, uh, but as a practical matter, if states withhold their enforcement assets, um, it, it really uh, will make marijuana uh, prohibition a, a kind of dead letter because 90% of the enforcement activity takes place at the state and local level. The, the federal government doesn't have the infrastructure to enforce a marijuana ban uh, across the country, not now anyway. So, no, I don't think the states have gone too far. Any different view over here? <laughs> 
Christine? Uh, well, well, not a not a different view. I would I would agree with that. I would also add that even to the extent that the CSA uh, does conflict with these state laws. I still think that uh, the states have not gone too far and it's a legitimate exercise of power because I too share Adam's view that the court was wrong in the Raich case um, to hold that Congress can uh, regulate the production and consumption of non-commercial wholly intrastate marijuana. And um, you know, again, practically that may be a little difficult. Uh, we look at our court system to resolve these questions and when the Supreme Court has said that this is legitimate uh, activity for the federal federal government to regulate, then uh, that seems to be, uh, some would say that, that that's that's the end of the question. But of course, we know that our Constitution doesn't even say that. The Constitution can be amended when the courts uh, get it wrong. And again, uh, state officials take an oath of office to uphold both their state and federal constitutions. And so if the courts get it wrong, uh, then, then the states are perfectly within their powers to enact this type of legislation, even if it seems to conflict with the federal uh, legislation, because the federal legislation is unconstitutional. Um, I, I, think, I think the Oklahoma and Nebraska case is interesting. Uh, however, um, and, and I, I'm sure that some would s sort of look at it as fair weather federalism in a way, but, uh, but I think it's interesting because I'm curious as to what the remedy would be uh, if Oklahoma and Nebraska were to win um, in challenging Colorado's legalization of marijuana within its borders. Uh, I'm not really sure what they expect the courts to order because, as Adam said, uh, what the courts would have to order is for Colorado to, in, in essence, uh, enact a law criminalizing marijuana within its borders, which, as we've discussed, the federal government does not have the authority to do. To me, it seems like those states ought to be suing the federal government because if, if um, what we have going on here is a decision, um, a prosecutorial decision and an enforcement decision where the federal government has said, yes, this is the law. The law says that this activity is illegal, but we're just going to look the other way if the states have decided um, you know, that, that they're going to protect this type of activity. And so it, it seems to me that, that if that is an illegitimate position for the federal government to take, then the states ought to be suing the federal government and asking the federal government to uh, enforce the laws that they're supposed to enforce. Um, and, and that's also an interesting uh, distinction as well that, that, is, that some might think is a distinction without a difference, but I think is important. Um, the president and also takes an oath of office to uphold the Constitution. And so the, the president also has a duty not to enforce laws that he believes are unconstitutional. And if, in fact, our president believed that the CSA was, is unconstitutional, then he is within his powers. And as I said, he would have a duty to not enforce that law. Um, but again, when the president determines that it's not good policy um, to enforce a particular law just because you know he doesn't agree with it or he doesn't like it, um, and we're going to defer to the states out of some sort of uh, deference to federalism or, or uh, allowing the states to be able to make these decisions, then uh, that is also a violation of the president's duty. So again, it, it, the, the reasoning here is important. And ultimately, the issue of whether or not this is in, uh, exceeding Congress's powers and whether or not um, Congress is infringing on a right is important to these questions as well. I would just offer a brief, a brief thought, which is that uh, I think uh, the marijuana context uh, sort of highlights in so many ways the promise of federalism and in some ways the perils of, uh, of federalism. And the promise of, uh, of, of federalism is that by empowering people at the state and local level to uh, pursue their vision of uh, a just life, uh, we see democracy in action in a way that we don't see necessarily at the federal level, or at least will be slower to occur at the federal level where we see people saying, hey, we think that medical marijuana is something that our patients, uh, that our residents should have access to, that we think that their lives really uh, are greatly enhanced by this, and uh, we need to uh, pursue legislation and a legal regime that allows this to occur. We're seeing it in the right to try area, too, with states enacting laws. Again, this is a reflection of democracy. We saw it in the context uh, of marriage until the Supreme Court stepped in and then imposed a national standard. Uh, and we, we see a real promise of um, state, when we call it state powers or states' rights, we, we empower people to come up with new conceptions of what would make a good society and enact those good conceptions into the law. But we also see some of 
the perils of it. Uh, when Colorado adopts marijuana legalization, a uh, manifestation, I think, very much of a sort of local democracy, uh, uh, a reflection of the values and the, of, of the people of Colorado, um, it does have these spillover effects on other states. And other states that have a very different view of democracy can be uh, significantly and adversely impacted uh, by the choices that Colorado makes. Um, and it also is the problem that Colorado has is that part of the uh, perils of federalism is, is that sometimes in a federal structure it's hard for these states to actually achieve their goals because given the size of the federal government and the nature of federal regulation uh, in our current society, maybe it should be scaled back significantly but not likely to be in any time, uh, I think in our, uh, in the near future at least, um, that is very difficult uh, for uh, even the people of Colorado to achieve their goals. Um, uh, there's major problems with banking, for instance. Uh, medical marijuana dispensaries can't use normal bank accounts because it's still considered money laundering under federal law. Uh, and so uh, there's major problems with credit and credit cards and processing uh, funds and it forces uh, in Colorado uh, dispensaries to use a lot of cash which makes them more dangerous. Um, and so uh, this is also one of the perils. Uh, because of our federal structure we're going to have conflicting laws that inhibit the ability of any one group of people to really pursue their vision of the good life through the democratic process even at the state level. So, so let's move from the, the states flexing their muscles vis-a-vis -vis the feds to um, when state governments actually want to limit the rights that the Supreme Court has declared belong to all citizens of the United States. Uh, so some states have been concerned by the Supreme Court's decision in Obergefell that the Constitution protects the rights of same-sex couples to marry. And other states um, have been concerned by the Supreme Court's decision in Heller and McDonald that every citizen has a constitutional right to keep and bear arms. So what are the legitimate limits of the state's responses to, to both these Supreme Court decisions? Adam? Sure, thanks. Um, yeah, so to start with Obergefell, um, you know, I think what the court is doing there and what it's done in other instances is take what's essentially a cultural issue, um, cultural social issue, that was meant to be resolved at the state level and federalizing it by turning it into uh, a novel kind of a right. Um, and there's a reason why cultural issues were left to the states, because culture differs from place to place. And that's one of the reasons why uh, the right that I posited before, the right to local self-government, I think is so important, um, particularly in the, in the social area. But every time you have one of these uh, decisions that creates a new federal, light, uh, new federal right, uh, you essentially disenfranchise the states. Um, and, and, you know, it, it, it's uh, in the press, if you read the, the reports about what, what did that decision stand for, what did the Obergefell decision stand for, um, the typical headline is, um, Supreme Court legalizes same-sex marriage. That's not what the Supreme Court did. The Supreme Court mandated same-sex marriage. That's a very different thing. It is now unconstitutional for a state to refuse to issue marriage licenses. And it's very specific. It can't be a civil union. It's got to be called, it has to have the word marriage on it. A marriage license to same-sex couples, regardless of the desires of the people of that state. Um, and so, you know, I think that this will have significant knock-on effects, um, particularly in the way that the court um, derived this new right, which is essentially by um, saying that anyone who disagrees with that right and who supports the traditional definition of marriage is a bigot. And that the laws that uh, sought to enshrine uh, uh, opposite-sex marriage uh, were equated with anti-miscegenation laws um, of the Jim Crow era. And so now if you're against this right, you're, you're, not just, you know, you're not just taking a cultural issue, you're against the Constitution. You're against, you're against civil rights. Um, and so we have some serious questions uh, that have already played out. We saw you know, a real question over whether religious organizations uh, that run adoption agencies like Catholic Charities, can they continue to exclusively place orphans with opposite-sex couples? 
In Massachusetts, that was not allowed. Catholic Charities withdrew from that market. You have uh, public accommodation laws and state human rights laws that um, may well already have and will continue to target private actors who oppose same-sex marriage, right? You've got the case of the Washington State florist. Um, her arguments that she didn't want to cater to a same-sex wedding uh, based on uh, free exercise and free speech grounds were rejected because at the time of that uh, case, uh, the, the, the voters of Washington had adopted uh, same-sex marriage as a, as a state law. Um, you know, will school vouchers, can they be used uh, at schools affiliated with churches that don't recognize same-sex marriage? Can a state university employ a professor who opposes same-sex marriage? Can professional licenses be withheld um, on the basis of support for same-sex marriage? Um, uh, you know, I, so I think you have some threats with that. On the, um, on the, on the gun issue, I'm, I'm, I'm going to defer a little bit to uh, Adam, who is more of an expert on, on the gun rights, but you know, I think you have, you know, it's a different context. It's not, it's not the same kind of social, social cultural thing, I would argue, but um, the, the court, certainly in Heller and McDonald, took an expansive view of Second Amendment rights, not, I would argue, at the expense of specific other enumerated rights, like free exercise. There's not that clear conflict that you see uh, beginning to play out in the same-sex marriage context, but at the very least, um, the decisions in Heller and McDonald uh, restrict the right I was talking about before, the right of local self-government, at least in those places like D.C. and Chicago that wanted to have um, more expansive uh, gun prohibitions. Um, and so, you know, what are what are legitimate state responses to get back to uh, the judge's uh, question here? Um, you know, look, I think uh, in the case of creating rights, it's, it's a little different from the marijuana case where you can have essentially state interposition, to use an old-fashioned term, where a state simply does not, uh, chooses not to enforce the, uh, uh, the, the, the federal law and withdraws its assets from enforcing it here. You don't have that, that option. States are now prohibited from, as I said, not issuing these marriage licenses. Um, but you can legislate around the purported rights to limit the collateral damage, right? So you can, and you've already seen this, a growth of the state-level RIFRA laws, um, and by their terms extending to marriage and explicitly protecting businesses and other actors in the private uh, marketplace from um, uh, from prosecution if they, for religious reasons, don't cater to or um, uh, recognize same-sex marriage. Um, I think that states should have a policy of non-prosecution of both public officials and private actors um, if their opposition to same-sex marriage is based on religious scruples. I think that it is also legitimate for states to defend those individuals with state money if they're prosecuted at the federal level for purported discrimination um, if, they act, uh, if they're acting on, um, as a matter of their free exercise of religion. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, and states should be clear that their free exercise protections extend to the marriage arena. Um, and I think that at the federal level, um, there, the, I think Congress, this is slightly outside the question, but I think Congress should seriously think about um, whether there's a case to remove certain areas from the jurisdiction of federal appellate courts to stop this kind of abuse. Because if this played out at the state level through state initiatives, state courts, you would at least stop the one-size-fits-all federalization uh, of marriage. Um, on, on, the, on the gun front, what's the right response? Well. You know, I'm not sure states have to do much because the courts are already doing it for them. Um, and the analysis I saw from the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence um, from, I think it was from last year, 96% um, of the post-Heller challenges to gun laws have been rejected. And so I'm not sure how much local autonomy is being restricted by those decisions, even though it, it could potentially. I think if states or cities find themselves um, that they, 
think that their discretion is being restricted, um, then there are other novel approaches, right? If you can't regulate guns under Heller, maybe you can a regulate ammunition. Um, taxes, user fees, other things that are within the power of state and local governments. Um, and certainly I think Congress should, should repeal, um, or at least consider repealing, the, um, their law that uh, is it their sort of attempt to tort reform uh, guns, where you, you, know, you, you can't have um, the, the, what is it, the Protection of Lawful Commerce and Arms Act that grants gun industry immunity from tort suits. And, and on the fair weather point, I mean, on the fair weather federalism point, I don't like the idea of holding gun uh, manufacturers uh, liable in tort, but I think it's a state issue. I don't believe in tort reform through congressional legislation. So um, I'll, I'll end it at that, but I think that um, I think there are various legitimate responses at the state and federal level. Well, we're certainly seeing a lot of uh, states enacting legislation in both arenas. We're seeing in the um, same-sex marriage, there is pastor protection laws, there's laws ending the state's role in issuing marriage licenses, or letting county clerks seek religious accommodation in issuing marriage licenses. And then on the gun side, um, I know the Ninth Circuit, we're seeing lots of California's creative efforts to roll back gun rights. Um, so, so Adam, what's, what's your take on whether uh, states should be able to, to limit constitutional rights in that way? Well, I don't think that states should ever be allowed to limit a constitutional right uh, as a general matter. Uh, if uh, we have a right that we recognize to be a constitutional, of constitutional status, the idea is that no one should be able to restrict that right. We should remember that one of the fundamental principles of American federalism is the supremacy of federal laws and of the Constitution. Um, we may not like those federal laws in certain instances. We may not like those interpretations of an ambiguous Constitution. Um, but those things are supreme in our society, and it's an important principle of federalism that can be easily forgotten in the effort to extol uh, 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 the values of local self-control and states' rights or states' powers. We see in the area of guns, uh, I generally agree with Adam that, um, uh, that we're getting a kind of uh, federalism uh, and states' rights through the Heller decision and the jurisprudence that's developed uh, in its wake. Most of the gun laws have been upheld. The vast majority of gun laws have been upheld. The few laws that have been uh, invalidated are, tend to be very extreme laws, uh, uh, outliers really in uh, American society. And as a result, the Supreme Court, um, the, through its jurisprudence, has allowed sort of many flowers to bloom. This is an area in which uh, many people uh, who consider themselves conservatives are unhappy because they want uh, the right protected in a broader, more uh, protective way from local self-control. But also highlights, perhaps, uh, and why federalism is something that's not just for conservatives, but something that's uh, uh, valued often by uh, the left as well. Again, not so much because of uh, a deep-seated desire for a federalist system, but again because they think that's a, po a way in which you can get your policy agenda uh, adopted uh, and enacted. Uh, and so in the gun area, it's generally the left that's talking about states' rights uh, and about local self-control to say that cities like Los Angeles or San Francisco or Chicago should be able to adopt different kinds of gun control regimes than you'd have maybe in rural Montana or out in Wyoming. Um, and uh, it is many uh, on the, cons uh, the political right who are opposed to that kind of uh, local uh, self-control. Um, there may be good justifications for it in terms of, well, there is a constitutional right and we're having a dispute over the scope and nature of that constitutional right. I think that is, uh, that's certainly part of uh, the dilemma. But we also see, uh, even outside of the context of, strictly speaking, um, the constitutional right, we see a, a real debate over federalism in the gun area. And it's flared up in a couple of different ways, in ways that both um, emphasize states' rights and in ways that emphasize federal power. So we have, for instance, in terms of emphasizing states' rights, we have uh, several states have enacted what they call Firearms Freedoms Act. Firearms Freedom Acts. And these Firearms Freedoms Acts basically um, uh, uh, express uh, mostly symbolically, uh, but sometimes maybe a little bit more with a little bit more teeth, uh, the idea that federal gun control laws uh, don't apply to uh, guns that are manufactured wholly within that state, 
and purchased or sold to other residents of that state and never enter into the stream of interstate commerce. Um, uh, these laws, like I say, mostly symbolic. Um, uh, they're not really enforced and, uh, of course, if you were to try to enforce them uh, and the federal government were, for instance, to crack down on a federally licensed gun dealer in Wyoming where they have a federal uh, um, uh, Firearms Freedom Act uh, uh, for not doing a background check when they were required to do a background check under federal law, I have no doubt that the federal courts would step in and support federal law given the current jurisprudence of federalism uh, where uh, in-state activity, um, uh, if it's aggregated, uh, in-state economic activity, if it's aggregated, has a substantial effect on interstate commerce, it would clearly apply to uh, gun purchases. Sometimes these laws can be a little bit, um, um, uh, well, I think they're always intended mostly as a matter of symbolism. They can go a little bit further. Wyoming actually uh, makes it a crime for federal law enforcement to try to uh, enforce federal gun laws on uh, purely in-state uh, gun laws. Uh, again, that's not been enforced by Wyoming, and I imagine it never will be, um, or uh, it will be quickly thrown out by the federal courts, uh, uh, should, it, uh, should it be. Uh, so that's an area where we're seeing some effort to try to sort of nullify the federal gun control regime. Even, by the way, I think despite the fact that at least under current constitutional standards, there is no doubt that, the, for instance, the federal background check requirement for uh, federal licensees selling guns is clearly constitutionally uh, permissible, both under the Second Amendment and under the current interpretations of the Commerce Clause. But we also see a real push for expanded federal power to protect uh, what people think of as gun rights, even though they aren't really rights in the sense of a right that's been recognized by the Supreme Court or any federal court uh, whatsoever. So we see, for instance, I imagine um, uh, people say, well, there's no federal gun control laws that we're going to get out of Congress. I think that's right in some ways uh, and wrong in others. If there's a Republican elected to the White House uh, and Republicans maintain control of the House as they're expected to do and uh, at least have uh, some measure of control over the Senate, that's a, a, an open question about how that's going to turn out, uh, I think we're very likely to see a federal gun law. We'd see a, fa a federal law providing for national reciprocity of concealed carry, uh, requiring a state like California to allow people who have concealed carry permits in other states uh, to bring those guns here. Uh, and indeed, uh, probably, depending on uh, the wording of the legislation, would even allow uh, a resident of the state of California to get a concealed carry permit, um, even if they couldn't get one in California, in, in the, maybe they live in Los Angeles or San Francisco, one of the counties that does not give these permits out very regularly, um, they would be able to um, uh, get a concealed carry permit by mail through, from Utah and then be able to carry as a matter of reciprocity in the state of California. I, I don't know about you, it doesn't seem to me to, uh, to be a real enhancement of states' rights to have federal legislation. And as Adam mentioned, we have uh, a federal law that restricts the liability uh, tort suits uh, against gun manufacturers and gun dealers uh, whose guns end up in, in the hands uh, of criminals. Um, again, whether that law is a good law or a bad law, um, uh, it's a federal law and shows that uh, from per the perspective of many gun rights supporters, uh, it's not about federalism. It's about guns and about what they can do to get their policy agenda protected as a matter of, uh, on guns, as a matter of law, rather than some kind of embrace of state power or federal power. It's you choose the, the mechanism that's going to get you where you want to go. And if it's states' rights, like nullification, you'll do that. If it's federal rights, like uh, federal national reciprocity law, you'll do that. So again, just highlights my general point that, uh, that most people at least uh, tend to be uh, fair weather federalists. Of course, no one here, but you know. <laughs> other, other thoughts? Um, well, I just add that, you know, this is, I think these same-sex marriage cases especially illustrate the importance, again, between the states' rights and states' powers concept, and um, that's because state-sponsored discrimination uh, is not a matter that our Constitution allows the, uh, to be left up to social and cultural preferences of the states, and the same is true of the right to bear arms, the right to possess a firearm for self-defense is not a matter that is to be left up to social and cultural preferences of a state and that's why uh, local control um, is not is not a, a value um, it is a means also to an end of protecting rights and so on the same-sex marriage cases 
I think that the courts, that the outcome is correct in those cases, um, but for the wrong reasons. I, I, I think the outcome was correct not only as a policy matter, but as a legal matter. Um, but, uh, but for the wrong reasons, I think that, you know, marriage is marriage in, in the way that the government grants marriage is a permission, not a right. Now, um, marriage, the marriage that was at issue in those cases is a piece of, piece of paper from the government rec uh, recognizing a contractual relationship. Now, I'm sure most, if not all, in this room know that recognize marriage as being much more than that. It certainly is to me, but the state has no role in that part of my marriage. The state simply has a role in recognizing the contractual arrangement that I have entered into. And in that sense, it's a privilege that is given to me by government. And so when the government grants a privilege, uh, it isn't a right, but it, the government must treat people equally when it grants a privilege. And so uh, in my view, the uh, same-sex marriage cases should have been about equal protection and not about the due process clause or a right to uh, this piece of paper from the government. Now that said, I think the, uh, the outcome is the same, and I think the outcome for, uh, in, as to how it affects the states is correct. Um, I think that um, marriage, as uh, it has been an issue here in these cases, is not a matter of religious freedom. Uh, and states uh, have a role in protecting religious freedom, of course. But again, here, um, nothing prohibits the churches from going in and um, you know, marrying whomever they would like to marry and not marrying whomever they would not like to marry. Um, but when we talk about a privilege that's granted by the government, then this is... Um, an important role that the courts have to play in making sure the government treats everyone equally, and if that limits federalism in some way, then so be it. That's the way the system was intended. So, so we've heard uh, about the federal court's role in the federalism uh, system, mostly as villains, as usual. So, so let's, uh, let's actually turn to this and ask whether the federal courts <laughs> let the federal governments get away with infringing rights. Uh, like affirmative action or infringing on free speech rights, but the, the states would be prevented from doing so in the same circumstances. And is, is this a good or bad thing? Adam? Well, there are certainly areas in which we would think that um, where we don't have a constitutional right, where we would want uh, states to be able to do things that perhaps the federal government cannot do. Um, we do have a federal government that has uh, limited powers, at least in theory. Um, part of the problem with the limited powers of the federal government is found in the text of the Constitution. I mean, the text of the Constitution gives uh, Congress powers that the framers thought were limited but in many ways, uh, because the nature of society has changed so drastically, many of those limits no longer uh, uh, hold. So if we think about regulation of interstate commerce, regu to regulate interstate commerce was a very limited thing uh, in uh, uh, the late uh, 1700s. There wasn't a lot of interstate commerce to regulate. Uh, and where there, there was some, I don't want to say there was none, uh, but far less than there is today. Now we have a very integrated national economy. Uh, that's not as a result of Congress's overreaching. It's a result of technological change, social change, growth of the nation. Um, and as a result, we have uh, an interstate economy. I'm willing to say that virtually everything in this room, other than maybe the people who were just born in one state, uh, is part of interstate commerce. From this microphone that probably uh, was uh, built in a foreign country, from component parts of uh, a lot of different, uh, that uh, came themselves from foreign countries or foreign states. Uh, the paint on the walls, uh, the clothes I'm wearing, nothing that I see in front of me is likely made exclusively and sold exclusively within a single state. There just isn't very much of that. Uh, the food that we have on our tables, the iced tea, none of it is uh, outside of interstate commerce. So even if the, the federal power hasn't changed, it's a power to regulate interstate commerce. Interstate commerce has changed so much that the federal government has so much more power. And it's not that the federal government is not doing what the framers imagined. The problem is they're doing exactly what the framers imagined, and the framers just didn't understand that the world would change so drastically, and that this grant of power would actually be quite a significant one. 
Now, that's not to say we couldn't quibble or have disagreements about particular rulings that uh, uh, interpret uh, uh, the Commerce Clause. Uh, from Wickard to Gonzalez, there's always uh, a few cases that seem like extreme outliers. I would suggest, however, that even if Gonzalez uh, versus Raich came out the other way, that even if Wickard versus Filburn came out the other way, it would not be a significant limitation on Congress's power today. I think that's evident in uh, uh, Chief Justice Roberts' uh, much derided decision in the Obamacare case. It sort of highlights that, remember, he went, uh, uh, he joined um, uh, Justices Scalia, Thomas, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Alito and Kennedy in saying that the individual mandate was not uh, a matter of interstate commerce and could not be justified under the Commerce Clause. But alas, there was the taxing power. And whether you agree that it was a tax or not a tax, it was at least a, uh, an open question. Uh, reasonable minds could differ, I guess, on it. Um, and it highlights that Congress would still have the power to step in and find other mechanisms to regulate so much uh, of what uh, 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 we, the people, sort of demand Congress to do. And we should also rec recognize that feature, I think, uh, when we think about federal power versus state power. We should recognize that often when the federal government acts, it's not like some entity, some brooding omnipresence in the sky that comes down and acts. The federal government is us, whether we like it or not. Separated from us, perhaps, by uh, many, many miles, at least here as we can see the ocean, uh, far away from Washington, D.C. But it's made up of congressional representatives that we elect. It's made up of senators that we elect. Those are the people who write the laws. Uh, the federal laws are signed by the president, again, that we elect. Um, and uh, there is a certain accountability that we can exercise with Congress and the president as well. Uh, it's not like that's anti-democratic and what happens at the state level is all democratic. It's wise to always, I think, remember what Madison's fear was uh, of excessive state rights. He said that states tend to be homogenous, and uh, homogenous states will tend to interfere with individual rights of minorities and outcasts and dissenters uh, a lot quicker than the federal government will, because the federal government has all the voices uh, embodied within it. And we can see this. I did a little study on free speech, uh, on free speech cases, uh, and looking at how federal courts approached free speech laws uh, adopted by the state, federal, or local governments. Um, and what we found, what I found in the study was that over, uh, you know, over, I guess, about a 14 year period of time, looking at every single federal court case on, on uh, free speech, that federal laws were upheld about 50% of the time. State, and, state laws were upheld about 24, 25% of the time. Local laws were upheld about 3% of the time. Now, what explains this? This was a couple, one possibility is just, well, Federal judges, some of you out there, maybe you guys just don't like local governments and you're biased against local governments. That's possible. That's one possible answer to it. But when you look at the substance of the laws, what you see is actually a lot of what Madison suggested, which is, is that the kinds of free speech restrictions that get adopted by Congress, because they have to go through this process where every voice is heard, where uh, major media outlets are, are watching out for it, where public interest groups that are devoted to free speech and related issues are paying attention, where you have strong staffs that take seriously constitutional issues, more or less, but strong staffs that really go through these issues and think about the legality of them. The result is that the law that comes out of Congress, by and large, not every case and certainly not uh, uh, certainly not in every case, but by and large, corresponds with existing constitutional doctrine. When you get to the state and local level, that's less likely to be the case. As you get to a local level, you get some small little uh, local community library that decides we're going to not let uh, uh, LGBT people come and use our public space, even though we allow everyone else to do it. Well, why is that? Well, partly it's because uh, a homogenous community uh, is uh, more willing to, st to stamp on the rights, step on the rights of uh, uh, outcasts and minorities, um, and less likely, perhaps, to have the kind of staffing that would uh, review the constitutionality of these laws to make sure that they correspond uh, with, uh, 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 with constitutional standards. I remember uh, Jack Weiss, who used to be a, a councilman here in Los Angeles, not really a small place, Los Angeles, but nonetheless a city, a locality, a municipality. Um, and, uh, uh, he asked when he was elected uh, if he could get a set of 
um, uh, the United States reports for uh, the city council to use. Um, and it took like two years just to get a copy, to get a full copy of the United States reports. These days it's just a computer database that you need. You don't want, want those, uh, uh, those printed volumes. But I remember talking to him and he taught it as an example. Like there's just not the kind of constitutional analysis that goes into a local law. Uh, and so as a result, I think that we, we should recognize that some of the d d dynamics of democracy might really inhibit constitutional rights and fundamental principles when they're enacted at the local and state level in a way that's not likely to be replicated uh, as easily, at least, at the federal level. So, so we've heard that the, the federal government and courts are, are good at protecting uh, rights that might be um, infringed on by homogenous local communities. Um, on the other hand, we're, we're now we're hearing about complaints about the federal recognition of rights infringing, for example, on uh, religious freedoms of individuals required to provide wedding services to same-sex couples or required to pay for contraception under the Affordable Care Act. If, if I could ask the panelists just very briefly, since we'd like to save a few minutes for questions, um, to, to talk about who should take the lead in balancing individual rights. Is it the federal government or the state government? Let me start with Adam. Sure. Um, <clears throat> well, no great surprise. I, 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 I vote for the federal government, uh, sorry, the state government. Um, but to, to, to Adam's point, you know, he was talking about there's really no democracy deficit if you're, um, if you're with the federal government, right? You, you, they're all elected congressmen. Um, there, uh, you know, let's let's look at the difference here. You've got you've got 535 elected congressmen. You've got 500,000 elected elected officials at the state and local level. Um, it's always strange to me that um, a, a lot of progressives uh, want to put all the power, all the progressives who talk about, and I'm not I don't direct this at Adam, but I mean in general, the progressives who talk about taking money out of politics want all the decisions pushed towards people who have to spend millions of dollars to get elected instead of their local officials. Um, so, you know, I think the fact that we're, when you get to balancing rights, you're already in a precarious situation because the structure has fallen down. The structure, as I've been talking about the whole panel, is what is our first line of defense. A structure that is that which isn't ceded to the federal government is retained by states and, and local government. And so, the um, Obergefell case is an exact uh, uh, example of that. Um, and I'm, in the interest of time, I'm going to keep it short. But um, I understand Christina's point about protecting rights under equal protection uh, analysis. But I would come back to saying this is a cultural issue. Because you don't get to the equal protection analysis until you have made the fundamental decision that a same-sex marriage is a marriage and therefore has to be treated, treated equally. And that's a cultural issue. Um, uh, people of good faith can disagree on that. Um, and so that is the classic kind of issue that should be decided at the state level through the political process, through the give and take that um, local democracy allows. Christina, a few comments on who should take the lead in balancing rights? Sure. So who should take the lead in balancing rights, the states or uh, the federal government? My answer to that is yes. Um, <laughs> which is a great lawyer answer, uh, but, but both should take the lead um, and both are, uh, have a duty to take the lead. So again, our elected officials at both the federal and state level, our judges at both the federal and state levels um, are, have uh, taken an oath to uphold the Constitution of the United States and uh, in the case of the state level, the state constitutions and um, the purpose of a federalist system is uh, that both levels of government will always be on watch. And when one oversteps its bounds or when one violates individual rights, then the other level of government can and should step in and defend those rights or, or push back against the overreach. Um, I, I do want to say that uh, the notion that the federal government is us uh, and that it is more likely that every voice will be heard at the federal level, uh, to me is, 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 I don't think is very um, accurate. I think that um, in, in lots of ways, uh, it, our democracy is sort of counterproductive at the federal level and, and the enormous concentration of power and, uh, and the, the many thousands and thousands of people that are represented by just one individual, especially here in California, um, when it comes to federal government, uh, means that voices are not heard. 
heard uh, at the federal level as much as they are at the local level. But sometimes, to the extent that our voices are heard at either the federal or local level, um, the Constitution protects your right to be heard, but the Constitution um, also does not um, say that your right or that your voice has to be respected or followed, and I think that that's important. So sometimes our voices are heard, and um, and they violate the Constitution, and that's why democracy itself also is just a means to an end, just as federalism is a means to an end, and I think we need to keep that perspective and judge these issues on a case-by-case -case basis and defer to local and state governments when those issues are left to the realm of policy preferences, um, and certainly deferring to local and state governments encourage, uh, encourages accountability so that we know who's making the decisions and that we can vote uh, the people out of office when they make bad decisions. But uh, our Constitution also keeps certain decisions out of the democratic process altogether. And in those situations, the state and federal governments both play a role in protecting individual liberties. Okay. Well, instead of letting Adam have the last word, I want to leave time for some uh, questions from the audience. We just have time for a couple of questions. Sir? involving the uh, Federal Arbitration Act. And um, we, we advocate preemption of the state laws by the Federal Arbitration Act. Does, does that make us fair weather federalists or, <laughs> or, or, or do we still qualify? Do you want to take that? Yeah. Yeah, look, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of extreme on, on preemption. I think it's a, it's a, it's a judge-made idea that came out in the progressive era as a way to, to um, do what the Supreme Court later did in the New Deal era of, of kind of forcing judicially a uniform uh, law. And so, um, you know, the, the, the Constitution prohibits certain actions from the states and says everything that isn't prohibited from the states by the Constitution is reserved for the states and the people. It doesn't say everything that's uh, forbidden to the states by the Constitution or Congress. And so um, I'm not a big fan of preemption. I'm a fan of supremacy. Um, and so I think if, if the Federal Arbitration Act is uh, a valid federal law and there's a direct conflict, that, that should trump. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Any other comments? Any other questions? Okay. A question for uh, Mr. Friedman, and I, I, I am very sympathetic to almost everything you say, but I have a little bit of a Winston Churchill concern, which is, you know, a strong federal government is the absolute worst thing in the world, except for the alternative. And so if the problem with the federal government is it stifles innovation, there's unnecessary rules, and so on and so forth, wouldn't it be much worth to have, you know, 50 masters with 50 different sets of rules? And, and living in California, why on earth would we want to give more power to the California state government? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, you, you might consider joining a, a lot of your fellow Californians and moving to Texas. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's why we have a federal system. People uh, vote with their feet, and I think in the aggregate, you, in, in a truly competitive system, you maximize uh, public policy. When states are competing for citizens and tax dollars, um, you, you, get, you get better policy. When you have everything at the federal level, your only uh, option is to migrate to Canada, which is what, you know, which is what, everyone, which is what all the progressives are saying during Bush too, you know. But uh, now, it's, now it's, you know, conservatives who are talking about leaving. <laughs> About five years ago, I asked General Meese what his solution was to the runaway abuse of power in Washington. And he said, you ought to look at the idea I proposed when I was Reagan's Attorney General, to give the states the same power as Congress to propose a specific amendment to the Constitution. And so you've talked a lot about the existing balance of power between states and Washington, but the Constitution does give the states some power to change rules, as Christina said, when the courts get it wrong. And uh, there's an argument that three times in American history the states have forced Congress to propose an amendment, the Bill of Rights and the 17th and 22nd Amendments. 
And I wonder what your comments would be on Ed Meese's proposed solution. I guess so. I, I look at this in part of the uh, in, in part uh, um, through the lens of uh, sort of a critical um, um, a critical view of our what seems to me a somewhat artificial distinction again between um, uh, federal representatives uh, and uh, the states. Um, there's been some influential work that we talked. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, we were talking in the last uh, in the last panel uh, uh, with. Um, uh, a little bit about um, uh, whether the different branches are going to protect their prerogatives against the others. And these days, sort of the latest academic thinking on that, for, uh, for what it's worth, is that we don't actually have separation of powers very effectively anymore because it's really about separation of parties. If the party in power uh, in the White House is the same party that's in power in the House, um, then the House is not going to protect its prerogatives as a general matter. Um, it's going to pursue its policy, the policy agenda, and if that's ceding power to the, to, uh, the president, it, it will be uh, uh, acceptable uh, because it's that. It's the same policy agenda. They won't protect their uh, own domain. I think we have that a little bit at the states too, um, that we think of the states as so different from the federal government. Look, if you have 34 states where they really, the political parties of those states uh, really want uh, a constitutional amendment, well, there's, it's hard for me to imagine why that wouldn't come out in a senatorial election campaign and push the senators uh, and their representative and the representatives in the House to push for that same kind of constitutional uh, amendment. Um, so it could be that maybe having the states get, having this sort of more formal power to propose a constitutional amendment uh, would be helpful, but I don't think it would really make much of a difference, I guess, at the end of the day. Uh, I think that if the people of Wyoming want a constitutional amendment on some issue, uh, it's hard for me to understand why that wouldn't come out through their representatives in Congress and through their senators um, in the Senate. Um, those demands should presumably still be manifest uh, and, and still come come out uh, through that process. So I'm not sure that having uh, uh, the, the, the current constitutional amendment process is one that fundamentally disempowers uh, the states, uh, because remember it is the states um, uh, that have representation in the Senate uh, and, and thus have a voice uh, on Capitol Hill. Well, I, th I think we've run out of time. I'm told that we're standing between you and lunch, which is going to begin as soon as we stop talking. So I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists for this presentation.